I, I, I'm good at crafts. I made a stick yesterday. Well, kind of found it, but I, oh, it's mine. So I made it. And then last night, the wife and I made a lad junior too. <laughs> Hello and welcome to this week's video. My name is Guy and we're not doing a circle video this week. It is our random video of the month, so to speak. This week's video, Crafting in Games, was a request from our Discord community, discord.gg forward slash great GM, whereby they asked, how do we do crafting in our games? It's an interesting question and one that when you peel back the layers, has so many wonderful opportunities, I can't believe I haven't included it more in my game. So today we're going to be looking at the function of crafting, the gameplay of crafting, the abuse, the abuse of crafting. It happens. And then the fun aspect, the fun, the cool, the exciting part of crafting. It's, it's, I'm so excited for this topic. I really, really, really am. So jumping in. Crafting in games as a function, what does it allow? What is it? Obviously, the PCs get items. They build stuff. They make stuff. They craft something out of components and they get something. They can then sell that something for an income. They can make money out of it. They can, you know, use it to barter, whatever. So there's a certain basic functionality. And then, of course, they can customize weapons. Now, that for me is the exciting part. Customizing the weapons means that not only has the character created a backpack, but they've created a backpack with 20 pockets in it because they want to be able to put different coins in different pockets and uh, something along those lines. Once you get a player who's doing that, you now have a player who is investing in your game. They're investing in your game world because they're trying to create something that they perceive as a need in that world space. It is to be encouraged. It is not to be denied. So when they say, well, I want to try and make something that's a bit like this and a little bit like that, if it's anachronistic, in other words, if it doesn't fit within the setting time period and there's no real feasible way that they would have come up with the idea of designing, you know, an Apache attack helicopter in the medieval era, aside from having to invent all of the various technologies that would be required to even start the process, you need to hold them back. But on the other hand, if there's a good explanation, I was watching those flipping seeds, you know, they rotate and how they gently glide down. They don't crash down. They don't fall down like pine cones. They float down. I was wondering if I could make a gyroscopic type of thingy. Okay, now that's interesting. And there's a whole bunch of adventures that come out of that. So these are the basic things. So we get stuff, we make money out of that stuff, or we can customize our stuff, which invests us in the game. And that's, for me, the really, really, really powerful and potent part. In terms of statting it, in terms of giving it numbers, Ron Cleese, mechanics as written are often broad strokes. They are designed for a range of adventuring opportunities, as well as for a lot of contingencies, a lot of solutions are provided, or at least hints are provided towards said problems, even if the rules themselves do not exist. When it comes to something like crafting, and the players are starting to design things that are outside of the box, outside of the realm of the rule systems itself, how do you accommodate? How do you mitigate the costs versus the time versus the functionality of the equipment and of the item. I would always suggest that if your players are interested, if they want to design, if they want to craft, if they want to be in this headspace, that you spend time with the player. I know, ha, isn't that insane? Spend time with the player, with the player, working out a system that will work within your game. Oftentimes, rule sets don't have comprehensive instructions on how this stuff works. It's so vast and yet such a, such a specific activity that we need to have refined it and reworked it so that it sits within our space, but that there is a set of predefined rules that we can refer to so that no one takes advantage of the situation or takes and, and uses it to advance their own gains and commit war and all that usual sort of nonsense that science is used for when we develop new things. What would we talk about? What? What? 
actually make sense for once. Crafting gameplay. Okay, gameplay, 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 gameplay. Facilities. They have to be able to build these things somewhere. The notion of, oh, I've got a portable smithy on my back. Do you know what goes into a portable smithy? Because I, I don't. I know that there's a big forgy thing and a fiery thing and a thingy and a thingy. I would imagine it's pretty heavy. Pretty heavy. So if they can accommodate, then sure, you have a portable smithy with you. Portable calligraphy set. Oh, that I could believe. So they need to have facilities and access to those facilities and the right ones. This can become an adventure. So that's absolutely fine. I have no problems with that. They could build their own smithy or their own pottery shed, for example. That is super cool. Why? If they have to build their own, it means they're investing in a structure. If they're investing in a structure, they're investing in your game world, which means that you can later on burn it down, take it away from them, occupy it, steal it, break into it, rob it. Oh, I don't know. Do any of the wonderful things that cause us to have these amazing adventures where the players slash PCs are on a vengeance quest to find out who attacked their private sanctum. So facilities are great, especially if the players want to build them for themselves. It takes time. It really does take time. And this can be a big problem. It really can be a big problem. How do you handle, how do you manage, how do you facilitate the time that is required to craft something? I want to build a 20 foot long boat. Okay, good for you. It's going to take you weeks to do that. Weeks. What are the rest of the party going to be doing? Ah, oh, well, we'll come to that a little bit later on in the video. But time, it does take time, and that's something that we need to think about. Sometimes the rule books don't give us too much insight as to just how much time uh, it's going to take, but it is of value to think about it from a logical perspective sometimes. Costs. Everything costs. The resources, the ingredients, there's implications. Are they even sourceable in this region? Can they be found? Those are things that, again, you need to decide. If it's a simple object, I want to make a brass ring, you need brass, okay, and a smithy or a small flame to melt the brass, etc., 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 etc. If it is something more complicated, then you are within your rights as the game master to require ingredients that are more complicated and that cannot simply be found but have to go and be foraged for. The glands of a fire salamander, for example. A classic, classic adventure. So there are many options that we have with regards to this. And we mustn't underestimate the value that these three things bring in terms of driving adventure and driving the group together rather than driving them apart. Uh, Avid. The opportunity to include the social life of a village or a city or a metropolis by having access to facilities is remarkable. You have an opportunity now to give insight into the players and the player characters as to the functioning economic situation of the space they find themselves in. This might seem as if it is a superfluous thing in comparison to saving the kingdom from destruction. However, when they meet the inhabitants, the creatures that live within the facility that they are trying to make use of, we can really understand the dynamic nuance of what life is actually like on the coalface at grassroots level. There is a significant opportunity to include NPCs from these facilities in the adventuring party. Have them join as supporters or as mentors, perhaps, to give to the party what the party so desperately needs the facilities for in the first place. It provides a great opportunity to introduce, introduce, I should say, introduce a new element to the game. And that element is someone who is productive, someone who is supportive of the party, and someone who wants the party to succeed. Never underestimate the power of doing that in terms of advancing the storyline, but also in terms of making the world feel that much more real. Yeah, exactly. So, the abuse, more abuse, I should say, it's going to happen. When a player discovers that they can make something and sell it for more money than the cost to build it, and all it took them was a few dice rolls and perhaps an adventure, 
they're going to make more. They really are. So you have the risk of mass production. Too much stuff is made. They, 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 they literally are just making tons and tons and tons of this, this stuff because they can. And that's a problem. That can become a problem, especially if it's too easy. So you need to moderate, temper it. And we can do that quite easily uh, by bringing in rivals. They flood the market, so now there's no longer a demand. So the price goes down. All those kinds of things are really, 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 really useful. It could also lead to underproduction, not in terms of in-game, but meta-game. The players go, oh, that's a brilliant crafting system, but you made it too difficult. We literally have to go and kill a dragon every time we want to make a wooden spoon. It's ridiculous, and I'm not doing it. Be very careful of making it too difficult to craft stuff. So there is this fine, fine balance. And speaking of balance, it can lead to unbalance. You allow the PC to modify their weapons by making them slightly sharper, giving them a slight advantage. Suddenly, every weapon they have has a slight advantage. And then every piece of equipment has a slight advantage. All those slight advantages add up, and soon you have super soldiers all because someone had a little portable smithy that apparently doesn't weigh very much. It can be a major, major risk. We need to learn how to mitigate those kinds of things. And a good way of doing that, hopefully, will come to us from Kuda. You should never abuse the system, and the system shouldn't abuse you either. Find balance between the two. If the players are inclined to be so creative as to make their own items, why not let them? If the players are disinclined, or if only one is seeking to do this, perhaps it is time to have a conversation with that one, or, alternatively, provide an NPC that might work with the party to do all of the creations that the party is looking for. This way, the one player who wants all the things from the making of the things gets the thing they wanted from the NPC, the NPC becomes a valued, valued character within the story that you can abuse later, because we always know NPCs are easy way to attack player characters. It is a simple solution. If only one, then NPC. If multiple, then do what Ron says. It's important. Right, you are. So how do we make it fun? How do we make it fun? Competition, rivals, an actual competition. To cry. Oh, we've heard that you've made great brassware. We want to invite you to a brassware competition to make better bra. It, you could have competition. Theft, tools, components, items, all those kinds of wonderful things. These just create adventure after adventure after adventure. Commission. I want to commission you to make me a brass hook. I hear you make very good brass hooks. The commission could be a ruse. It could be a genuine commission. There could be an actual threat. If you don't make the best brass hook in the kingdom, I shall cut your head off because I am Prince Kingly. Whatever. I mean, the commission. It could be a commission. And the, obviously the components. Supply and demand. I can't give you any more mithril. The mine's dried up. There's spiders at the bottom. Oh, dearie me. If that isn't the most classic of adventure starts, I don't know what is. So fun is definitely, definitely to be found in crafting. You just have to look for it. Now, you don't have to do this every single time the character goes off and tries to craft stuff. That would be insane and very difficult to manage. I really think that there's a certain balance that one needs to strike. So, so bear that in mind. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yes, this must be fun. It must be something that is amusing. But is it amusing for the players? Is it fun for the players? This is the question that you should be asking yourself before launching into the theft of their equipment or the loss of those materials that they have slowly gathered together over a great amount of time. Yes, it's fun on paper as, uh, you know, it's great, nice, lovely, but the players themselves, they've slogged to get the stuff. So before you have a thief, just take it away. Make sure you've worked out how to give it back to them at the end of it so that there is a reward for them being involved in your game world that they want to create stuff, so they need the materials. So if you take it away, give it back twice, fold, two, twofold, t t t double, I mean, what's the word? Where I Can we do this again, please? I, I feel like 
my message wasn't getting... I mean, you take it away, but you'll give it back again, and you'll give more, because that's what happens when people go on adventure. Why can't we do do-overs? Now, what about the rest of the group? What about those... Who waits for whom? I mean, the one player is a good smithy, so they go off and they do smithing. If anyone's ever played Skyrim, you can spend hours doing crafting stuff and end up with five scraps of leather and a tin pot helmet. So what does the rest of the party do? Generally speaking, if construction is going to take a long time, more than a couple hours, I'll run a side adventure. Quite literally, okay, you're working in your alchemical lab and you are busy doing your various bits and bobs. The rest of you are sitting in the tavern when the tavern wench comes up to you and asks if you wouldn't mind giving her a hand with her horse. Only it's a bit tricky because it's on the roof right now. I mean, a little, a little side adventure. And the way that you do it is that the side adventure is running. Everybody rolls initiative, including the character who's crafting, by the way. And then you cut between them. You're being attacked. You're being stabbed. You're being blasted with magic. And you're tinkering away on the little metal, quite happy. Oh, you've run out of coffee again. Oh, bother. Now you'll have to make more coffee. And then it stabs you. And it, it can be a lot of fun. And again, not every time the character goes crafting. Sometimes it could just be social time. Okay, you're crafting. What are you guys doing? You're going to go and speak to the NPCs. An NPC who you're trying to build up as being a friend to the party comes up and says, Oi, wouldn't you like a drink? Let's go and have a drink. Why not? You have lots of options. Or it could be a skills up opportunity. Because the player is crafting and ostensibly they are using in-game resources, they're using die rolls, they are doing things that will enhance their character, presumably with the with the item that is being crafted. The rest of the players should have the same opportunity to do so, and the same opportunity to fail, in my opinion. So if the character is creating, let's say, a weapon that gives them a bonus to damage, why not present the fighter with an opportunity to train with an old blind master, and if the fighter passes a certain number of challenges and checks, equitable to what the smith or the crafter is busy doing, they gain a small bonus to their damage as well. It's a game mechanic. A lot of people might be terrified by the idea that characters can advance without a level progression requirement, but it certainly does allow for the party to skill up whilst the crafter is busy. So that's something that I would look at and, and definitely not be afraid of, is to see about how do we make this experience something that everybody can participate in rather than just what one person is doing whilst everyone else waits. So that for me. Oh, now, just hang on a second there. You just slow yourself down. You didn't give me an opportunity to talk. When we look at all of the different ways in which we might incorporate the player character's desires to construct tools and items and such like, we never need to forget the fact that if we create an adventure where a tool has been stolen from them, that is a journey that we're going to have to explore and expand upon, which is not a bad thing. No, it is not a bad thing whatsoever. We need, though, to bear in mind, it is going to disrupt the flow of the game. It is going to add in a component that we may not anticipate the major ramifications thereof. So don't do it too often. When there's a rival construction, crafter, whatever you want to call it, when they're coming in and they're throwing their weight around, that is going to have implications for the entire party. So bear that in mind. There is going to be bigger things afoot here. Either tie it into your main campaign or make sure that once the adventure is over, it is done. There is no room for revenge or return. Oftentimes, we don't anticipate the power that starting one of these little adventures is going to bring. Sometimes it can derail as suddenly the players are going off starting their own guild and trying to have a war, a trade battle, all those kinds of things. We don't want that. The story's got to come back to the main point. Point. So these little sub-adventures, these emergent adventures, whatever you want to call them, make sure to te neaten them up, tie them up together, bring them back, put some concrete around their feet, throw them over a bridge, and make sure they're done when they're done. There's no room for interpretation thereafter. 
it's a great opportunity for investing players and their characters into your world, for upgrading them, for giving them rewards, for generating a dearth of adventures. I mean, just, 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 just so much um, opportunity there. And, and just brilliant, 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 brilliant ways of making your world feel alive. Those are my thoughts. What are yours on crafting? Leave a comment down below. Let's share. Let's learn from one another. How did you make crafting something that people actually enjoyed doing in your game world without breaking your game world? Until next time, join us on Discord, discord.gg forward slash great GM, where you can ask questions, suggest video topics that we will then hopefully put together for you and you can watch them like whoever asked for this particular video. I forget the name of the user now, but who knows? Maybe you could suggest the next video. Until next time, however, I wish you and yours the very happiest of gaming. Sometimes. And... <coughs> <coughs> costs.